Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. It's, it's so good to be here and, and to see all of you. Uh, somebody told me a long time ago, don't let any Christians be behind you. Uh, I gotta honestly tell you, I'm not one of these guys who walks around when I preach. So I'm gonna hang out here as much as possible and the screens will carry it everywhere the best way to do that. But I'm so glad that you're here. I gotta have my day started. I got up this morning and we got all ready to leave and I went to go out of my room in the hotel and I couldn't get out. The door wouldn't open. The lock was stuck. So I called down to the desk and I said, uh, this is Mr. Jeremiah and I'm 410 and my door's locked. And the girl at the other end, she said, oh, Dr. Jeremiah, we love you so much. We're gonna keep you as long as we can. I said, you better get somebody up here and get me out of this room. <laughs> and I finally took my credit card and fooled around with it and I got the door to open. Never have been locked in before. I've been locked out many times, but never locked in. And uh, I wanted to tell you that in anticipation of the opportunity to do this today and the realization that there is no human way I could sign all these books at the table, we came in yesterday and I have signed 37 boxes of books so that everyone who gets a book has a signature. If it looks a bit degraded, it's probably because I did it toward the end of the day yesterday and my signature sort of deteriorates after a few boxes. But it's my signature, I don't have a stamp, and it's sort of my way of saying this book is for you, it's personal, I hope you read it and, and be blessed by it. Afterwards. Uh, I'll be back at the table, and we have a lot of folks back there with all these books. And uh, I'm going to kind of stand off to the side and shake hands. I'm not going to sign anything because it's too crowded back there, but I just would like to shake your hand and, and say thank you for what you do in the kingdom. And we'll have to do it quickly. You can't tell me your life story. I, I, I can't solve your counseling problem. If your marriage is in trouble, you've got to go see your pastor. I can't deal with that. But I just want to say thank you, and uh, thank you so much for being here today. Just a word about this book and how it came to pass. I mentioned a bit of it last night, but for those of you who may not have been here, or if I didn't say it clearly, for all these years that I've been in the ministry, I have been teaching prophecy. I don't do it all the time, but I've taught through Daniel and Revelation and um, many prophetic books. It's amazing to me how many guys won't do that. How many pastors say, I don't, I don't do that. I had a guy tell me one time, I don't teach the book of Revelation because it's not relevant. I said, well, hang on, it's getting more relevant every day. <laughs> you know, every, and if you've been watching the news this week, how many of you know that in the, in the book of Revelation, it talks about the martyrs who were beheaded? I haven't heard that term in our culture until the last six months. It's, it's a part of our culture today. Prophecy is becoming a reality. And uh, I wanted to find a way to tell the story of the book of Revelation in, in a new and fresh way so that people would really read it and really understand it. So we came up with this idea of the characters that are in the book of Revelation. Those are the agents of the apocalypse. The ten characters are a group of characters, and it's like this. John on the Isle of Patmos is the first agent. Then you have the martyrs. Then you have the two witnesses and the 144,000 and you have the dragon and the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth and Jesus Christ the victor and Jesus Christ the king and Jesus Christ the judge. So those are the 10 chapters. And then I have a friend who's pretty good at writing fiction so I took all of my plot from the book of Revelation laid it out for him and I said I want you to write a story that will capture the imagination of the people so that they will read the story and it's very like it's happening right now and then I'll put the rest of it at the end of each chapter the scripture behind the story now I mentioned last night C.S. Lewis is the one who said if you get people's imagination you get their heart if you get uh, the information you get their head and you know learning is a matter of the heart and the head so what I'm going to do today 
I don't do this very often and uh, probably won't ever do it again, I don't know. But I'm gonna tell you this story and then I'm gonna give you the scripture behind the story. And this particular story is the way it all ends. This is about the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Jesus the victor. Now I need you in my stories, we've given some of the players a name and this name is not from the Bible. For instance, the Antichrist, we called him Judas Christopher. And uh, you're gonna hear me talk about him a bit. That's the Antichrist. And the false prophet is a guy named uh, Dethero, Damon Dethero. Those are about all the names you need to be aware of in this story. And so humor me a little bit at the beginning. I'm coming to the Bible right, right close. Judah for Christopher, leader of the United World Empire, sat at the head of a long oak table with his governing council all around him. Seated behind the table were representatives from the major world nations, chosen for their influence within their countries. All of them had pledged allegiance to Christopher and had accepted the universal number required to participate in the worldwide economy. President Christopher grew increasingly belligerent as the meeting went on. He was smarting from the defeat of his armies that he'd commanded to destroy Israel. The primary targets of his verbal storm were the representatives from Russia, Iran, Egypt, and Ethiopia the axis of nations whose armies had failed him. The worst of it fell upon the Russian dignitary, Alexander Ivazov, since Russia's generals had directed the campaign. What happened? Christopher bellowed. You were equipped with the most up-to-date weaponry, leading the world's largest, best-trained military force against a paltry excuse of a nation. I even paved the way for your success with the peace treaty I made with those gullible Jews. They had already disarmed. They were practically sitting ducks. How could you possibly have failed? And yet you bumbling fools managed to find a way. Ivasov, red-faced and seething, finally exploded. You know very well why we were defeated. We were hit with an earthquake that topped the Richter scale and monstrous hailstones mixed with sulfurous fire our armies were decimated. So you say, Christopher's voice was cold as frost. But it wasn't the fire or hail or earthquake that got you, was it? It was panic. Your troops lost their heads and started firing on anything that moved, and the only thing moving was their fellow soldiers, running for cover like terrified rabbits. You idiots annihilated your own armies. With all due respect, sir, you were not there. If you had been engulfed in choking, blinding smoke and dust as our troops were, you would understand the confusion. They couldn't even see the sun. No army on earth had weapons against the disasters that we faced. You may soon face even greater foes because I'm ordering you and the other nations represented in this room to raise new armies. We will attack Israel again. Silence blanketed the room. After a tense moment, the Russian representatives realized that the time he'd feared had come. Mr. President, he said, you cannot do this to us. Do you realize how tenuous your hold on the world is? Your string of broken promises, ignored treaties, military conscription, and exorbitant taxes have angered many nations. Your tyranny is fostering poverty and disease around the world. And when incidents of rebellion are put down with brutal force, deep resentment fosters like a boil. Mr. Ivasov, Christopher's voice was low. If you don't stop your ranting this minute, no, I will not stop. Someone in this room needs to tell you what you refuse to hear. If you demand another conscription after our recent losses, it will trigger massive revolt in the Russian coalition of states. Christopher called for the guards to enter the room. Take this traitor out and shoot him. He pointed straight at Ivazov and take his gutless minions with him, gesturing at the representatives from China, Egypt, and Iran. I will not tolerate this kind of insubordination. The guards seized the four dissenters and escorted them out the door. Their removal effectively stifled any debate. 
Archbishop Dethereau rose to address the group. My esteemed council members, please allow me to apprise you of the reality of this situation. President Christopher has not made his decision in a vacuum. He and I both serve an immensely powerful master who stands invisibly above us all. He has single-handedly wrestled this earth from God, and ever since the beginning, he has fought to solidify his rule over it. For the past 2,000 years, his primary opposition has been Christians. Now that they have disappeared from the planet, our dominance is almost complete. When we annihilate the Jews, the entire earth will belong to us. Judas Christopher immediately began to build his military coalition, and before the year came to a close, he had amassed the largest army ever assembled in history. His troops numbered in the millions. With the armies assembled, Christopher began to send troops and weaponry into Israel. Aircraft carriers were stationed offshore along Israel's Mediterranean coast. He landed his ground troops near the cities of Haifa, Hadera, Netanya, Tel Aviv, and Ashdod. Christopher quickly captured Herzliya, coastal city just north of Tel Aviv, and he set up his operational headquarters there. He was in the war room with his general orchestrating their march toward Jerusalem when there was a loud knock at the door. A marine colonel burst in. Sir, pardon the interruption, but we just received an urgent intelligence report. Russia has been raising its own army, an enormous coalition amassed from former USSR client states. They are now marching against us from the north. Egypt and its allies have also raised coalition armies, and they're coming at us from the south. Where are they now? Our reports confirm that Russia's axis is crossing the Golan Heights and pushing southward. The Egyptian coalition is encamped on the Sinai, and they're moving north at a rapid pace. Judas Christopher slammed his fist onto the table, rattling coffee cups and water glasses. Our attack on Jerusalem will have to wait, he growled, canceled the air raid immediately. The next morning, Christopher's northern armies met the Russian allies at Tel Megiddo on the plains of Israel. His southern divisions met the Egyptian coalition at the city of Be'er Shiva, the edge of the Negev desert. As the battle raged, Christopher and his staff generals kept their eyes locked on a ceiling monitor in the war room. Mr. President, the colonel burst into the room again. His face was ashen and his voice urgent. I have terrible news, sir. What is it? We have just learned that China has also raised an army, and it's twice the size of all of the combined armies that we are now fighting. How many troops are there? The estimates are in the millions. But that's not the worst of it, the colonel paused. They're coming at us from the northeast. They just crossed the dry bed of the Euphrates at Air Raqqa. Their planes and rockets are already bombarding the Golan Heights, and their ground troops will reach the border by morning. For the next several months, there wasn't a single square foot in the entire nation of Israel where, where sounds of war could not be heard. The mood in Christopher's war room oscillated between euphoria and despair as he and his staff watched their armies advance and then retreat again and again. But slowly, the advances began to outnumber the retreats. Feeling assured of victory, Christopher called a meeting of his generals at the conference table in front of the electronic screen. Gentlemen, he said, my forces now have the upper hand throughout all of Israel. We have pushed the northern rebels back almost to Lake Tiberias, and the southern rebels have been forced to northern Sinai. He turned to look at the archbishop. You know what this means, don't you, Dethro? Of course, it means you can now redeploy enough troops to accomplish your original goal, the final destruction of the Jews and Jerusalem. Gentlemen, the president said, tomorrow we will launch our final campaign against Jerusalem. It will be the end of this enemy nation that our master has tried to annihilate for centuries. After tonight's air blitz, our ground troops will march in and play the city the way a child gathers her eggs. The next morning, President Christopher and Archbishop Death led their troops toward the undefended Jerusalem. They reached Mount Olivet and positioned their troops for the invasion. Together, they stood on top of the mountain the moment before giving the signal to attack. In seconds, they would have the satisfaction of watching the city of Jerusalem suffer its final blow. Suddenly, a resounding trumpet blast shattered the air. Startled, Christopher looked around for its source. 
when he saw his troops gaping upward in terror, he followed their gaze. The morning revealed a mighty warrior astride a magnificent white horse. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and on his head was a crown glittering with gold and gems. He held a sword in his mouth that flashed brightly in the sun. An enormous army of men and women were in the clouds behind him. They were robed in white, and they too were mounted on white horses. The entire sky from east to west was filled with masses of magnificent beings, human like but with faces as brilliant as lightning. The entire throng hovered expectantly as if ready to descend. With a loud shout, the magnificent warrior and his hosts descended. Judas Christopher, trembling violently, proceeded toward Jerusalem, urged onward by his hatred for the Jews and his fear of his master. Suddenly, Christopher stopped short and collapsed on his knees. Directly in his path stood the towering figure of the mighty heavenly warrior, mounted on his white steed. Blazing eyes burned into Christopher's soul like a white-hot laser. The Antichrist crumbled to the ground beside the quaking death row. Then a rumble came from somewhere deep in the earth. Mount Olivet cracked apart at its peak and a gap opened into a crumbling chasm all the way from Jerusalem to Jericho. In the next moment, white-clad beings seized Christopher and death row and hurled them screaming into the chasm. Christ, with sword still in hand, remounted his steed and forged into the thick of Christopher's troops. Once the Antichrist armies were decimated, the throngs of angels ascended back into the heavens as Christ returned victorious to Mount Olivet. The joyous white-robed saints gathered around him and lined the road before him, paving the way from the mountain to Jerusalem's Zion Gate with a thick carpet of palm branches. The air rang with joyful shouts as Christ made his second triumphal entry into his holy city, this time mounted not on a humble donkey, but on a great white horse, and this time he was there not to suffer, but to rule. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, I've, I've read that story a number of times. It was a part of writing it, and every time I read it, I get the chills <laughs> just to think about what's ahead. Now, that's the story. Now, I want to tell you where that all came from. I didn't make this up. It's the imagination of some guy who you know, stayed up too late at night or didn't have anything to say on Sunday, so he made up his sermon. This is right from the Bible. In the next few moments, you're going to see up on the screen screens some things and some verses I want to take you through this and we can do this in the time allotted so hang with me throughout the book of Revelation you will notice if you read it that it is filled with inflicting unprecedented suffering and persecution of God's people if you read the Revelation you wonder how long is it going to take for God to get this right and sometimes we look at our world today, isn't that kind of what we say? We look at all the suffering and the anguish and the war and now this uh, brutality. When is God going to act? But in Revelation chapter 19, the moment comes that God's people have been waiting for since Christ ascended into heaven before his awestruck disciples. In that moment, Jesus Christ returns. The last few chapters of the book of Revelation and Matthew chapter 24 give us some wonderful details about the way Christ will return to earth in judgment and justice. First of all, I want you to notice how much of a priority this is in the Bible. Many Christians think that in the book of Revelation alone, we are told that Jesus is coming back. I want to give you a brief survey so that you will never think that again. Matthew 24, 30 says that at time the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Now most of us are really familiar with the first coming of Christ. We celebrate that at Christmas. We know a lot about the first coming. And we're often surprised when we learn, if we study the Bible, that the references to the second coming of Christ outnumber the references to the first coming by a factor of eight to one. For every time you read in the Bible about Jesus coming in Bethlehem, you will read eight verses about his coming again the second time. Scholars have identified 
identified 1,845 biblical references to the second coming of Christ. In the Old Testament, Christ's return is emphasized in no less than 17 books, and the New Testament authors speak of it in 23 of the 27 books of the New Testament. Seven out of every 10 chapters in the New Testament mention his return. In other words, one out of every 30 verses in the New Testament teach us that Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth. And ladies and gentlemen, in this day and age when there's so much discouragement and dismay, we need to be reminded that God has this in control, and if we will just read the book he's given us, we won't be so afraid because we know how this is going to end. Amen? Now, in the first two books written for the early church, in First and Second Thessalonians, the return of Christ is taught in every chapter. The Lord himself referred to his return 20 times. The second coming is second only to salvation as the most dominant subject in the New Testament. The fact that Christ's second coming features so prominently in Scripture is an indication that we as his followers need not be afraid. We should lift up our heads for our redemption is drawing nigh. The priority of his return. Now, the Bible also predicts this, not just in Revelation or Matthew. Hebrews 9.28 says, To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. It's interesting to me that if you go all the way back to the book of Genesis, there's a character in the book of Genesis who we are told later on in the Bible made mention of the second coming. This is an interesting anomaly in Bible study. For this person is Enoch. And we have no record in Genesis of Enoch having said this, but Jude in the New Testament tells us that he did, so we have to know that he did. Listen to what Jude said. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all the ungodly, among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things ungodly sinners have spoken against him just think about it where's the second coming first mention according to Jude it's been by Enoch who's in the book of Genesis and then you to Daniel of course Daniel was known for his prophetic dreams listen to what Daniel said Daniel said, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is everlasting, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Daniel said, Jesus is coming back. And then you move over in the Old Testament to one of the minor prophets by the name of Zechariah. The prophet Zechariah predicted the final epic battle between Christ and the Antichrist. Here's what he said. The Lord will go forth and fight against those names as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. And then what did Jesus say in his Olivet Discourse? Jesus describes this, he says, As the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Not only Jesus, but the angels talked about it. After Jesus ascended into heaven, you remember what the angels said? Speaking to his disciples as Jesus was ascending to heaven, the angel said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into the heaven? This same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. The angel said he's coming back. And Paul, in his letter to the Thessalonians, describes what the day of judgment will be like. He said, the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and be admired among all those who believe. And finally, in the book of Revelation, and this is the scripture that I sometimes write in this book when I have time to write the scripture. Revelation 1, 7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, and even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. That's the prediction of his return. Somebody says, well, uh, the second coming is only found in a few, few verses. I beg to differ. It's found 1,849 times in the Bible. And my friends, anything that's found that many times in the Holy Book, we should take note of it, and we should ask ourselves, what should we be doing with this information? I really believe, people say, well, prophecy is, is dark and it's discouraging. No, it's not. How many of you know if you're in a battle and you already know who wins, you can fight with a great deal of courage? <laughs> Amen? And we can be courageous people as, as, as followers of Christ. Now, the Bible also tells us where he's going to return. When he comes in the rapture, we're going to be caught up to meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Seven years later, when he comes with his saints, here's what Zechariah says. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from the east to the west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. This last year, we went to Israel, and our friends, the hoppers, were with us, and we had such a wonderful time. Uriel, um, the Mike, the uh, Kenny G of the Christian world, you know, the guy playing the saxophone up here, he's from our church, and we took him, and we had so many wonderful things. In fact, I love to tell us about Uriel. We were in the garden tomb um, the last day of our tour, and if you've ever been there, there's a lot of trees there, and I didn't know this at the time, a lot of birds live in those trees. And we were in there uh, waiting for the message, and he got up to play the Via Dolorosa, and all of a sudden, every bird in that garden started to sing. I have never seen anything like it in my life. I poked my wife. I said, listen to the birds. Now, I've told Uriel that means he's for the birds, but I don't think he really, you know, he knows better than that. It was an amazing thing that that tone from that saxophone made all the birds sing. And uh, we, uh, we had a meeting one day on the steps and I always love that place because you can look out from that steps and you can see the mount where Jesus ascended to heaven. And it's the very same place where he's coming back. And the Bible says one day Jesus is coming back and he's going to land on that mountain. And when he does, the mountain's going to part and there's going to be a huge chasm between the mountains. We can't know exactly when our Lord's second coming is going to occur, but we know where it's going to occur. And Zechariah doesn't leave any room for discussion. The Bible tells us how we are to prepare for his return. I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and the armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Here we, are found, here we find out what preparation goes into the return of Christ. In the final showdown, all the rebellion of the prior seven years of the tribulation will come to a head at the Battle of Armageddon, which I described in the drama. In this battle, the Antichrist, the kings of the earth, and the pitiful souls that follow them will gather one last time to try to defeat Jesus Christ. And when Christ's return draws near, they will do everything they can to try to prepare for this battle. How many of you know that common enemies um, bring people together? Here are all these armies that have been fighting each other, fighting against Israel, and then Jesus appears on the horizon, and all of these battles going on between these people coalesce into the enmity they have toward Jesus Christ, and all the armies of the earth under the leadership of the Antichrist think they can fight against Jesus Christ. And then the Bible tells us what happens. The portrayal of his return is in verses 11 through 13 in Revelation 19. Listen, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. The first time he came to earth, Jesus appeared in obscurity. But the second time, the Bible says, every eye will see him. The entire world will witness his return. Somebody say, well, that's because of satellite television. How many of you know that the creator of the world does not need satellite television to do what he wants to do? <clears throat> if, he, 
If Jesus wants you to see it, you're going to see it. <laughs> Christ the victor looks like no other warrior in the history of the world. According to Revelation, this is what it says. His eyes were like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the Bible tells us that when he comes, he won't come alone. Do you know when you go to heaven as a believer in the rapture, you're up there for seven years, but when Jesus comes back for the second return, you get to come with him. This is what it says, the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, follow him on white horses. When Christ returns, he's going to bring all of his angels and all of the believers who've been raptured to heaven, we're all going to be dressed in white. Now somebody said, who goes to war dressed in white? You don't go to war dressed in white, but this is different. The Bible says, Zechariah says, the Lord my God will come and all his holy ones with him. Jude says, listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones. Notice how they're dressed. They're dressed not in military fatigues, but in dazzling white. But you don't have to worry about their pristine uniforms getting soiled because their role isn't to fight. They're ceremonial and honorary. They will not fight. Jesus slays the rebels all by himself. And the deadly sword comes out of his mouth. So why are we there? We're the cheering section. We're, we get to see this. We get to see our Lord in his own power decimate these vile enemies who come for him. The Bible tells us the purpose of this is that in righteousness he judges and makes war. Verse 11 gives the central passage for his return to the earth to judge and make war. And verse 15 reveals some of the details. It says, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Jude describes this in his, in his book. And I read this verse to you before, but I want you to hear it in this context. <coughs> Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment, to convict all who were ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Did you notice in that passage the word ungodly is in there four times? What that does, men and women, is describe what we're facing in our culture today. What we're facing is ungodly men who do ungodly deeds in an ungodly way, and one day the Lord God is going to come back and the ungodly will be dealt with. He will impose judgment on them who have defied him with the sword of his mouth. He will smite the ungodly from all the nations. Sometimes we look around today and we think the enemy is winning, but he is not. The Bible says it only appears that they're winning. If they knew what we knew, they wouldn't be so cocky. The Bible says when Jesus comes back, listen to me, Jesus is going to smite them with the breath of his mouth. He's going to look at all of these enemies and he's going to go, and they're done. The breath of the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ called this world into being. Did you know that? He spoke and it was done. The breath of the mouth of the Savior of the world who created the world in which we live has all the power he needs. He will, out of his mouth, breathe on these evil people who have caused so much destruction and pain. And in one moment, everything will be made right. And the Bible says that those who have fought against him, the Antichrist, and the false prophet listen to these words from Revelation 19. And I saw the angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds of the heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all the people, free and slave, both small and great, 
and all the birds were filled with their flesh. The Bible says that the carnage in that day when Jesus wins the war is going to be so great that he's going to call all the birds of all the earth to come and feast. In this chapter, there are two feasts. There's the marriage feast of the Lamb, and there's the Supper of God. I would suggest you make reservations for the marriage feast of the Lamb, because if you don't, you won't go to the supper, you will be the supper. <laughs> Amen? Because the birds are going to come and feast on those who have rebelled against God. The punishment of the wicked at this moment will be so horrific and death so extensive that an angel from heaven will summon the birds of the sky together for a grisly feast of human flesh. Notice how the Bible describes these people. The mighty men of the earth, the captains and the kings, the free and the slave, both the small and the great. And of course, the beast, the Antichrist, who caused the rebellion and led the insurrection against the king, he himself will be dealt with. It says the beast was captured and with him the false prophet. And these two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. <clears throat> the Lord will snatch up the beast and the false prophet, Judas Christopher and Damon Deathrow, if you will. And these two evil characters who have the unwanted honor of going to hell even before Satan, they will be the first two inhabitants of hell. A thousand years later, after the millennium, Satan will join them. By the way, a thousand years later, the Bible says those two dudes are still there. They've been there suffering for a thousand years. The Bible says the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So there you see, ladies and gentlemen, the story's complete. The victory is settled. There's no possibility it's going to end any other way. Satan has no power to make this happen in any other way than the way God said it will. And it reminds me of a period of history that many of you will identify with because you have gray hair like I do. In June of 1944, the people of France had suffered for four years under the tyranny of Adolf Hitler. His armies had invaded France in 1940 as part of his unholy ambition to turn all of Europe into a Nazi super state. But then, on June 6, 1944, General Eisenhower commanded Allied troops to cross the Channel from England and invade the fortified beaches of Normandy and liberate the French nation from oppression. Editor James Kushner describes what happened on that fateful day now known as D-Day. Listen. Before dawn and throughout the rest of the day, sea, land, and air were rent by flashes, thunder, flying metal parachutes, while fresh wounds in the earth and men erupted in sand and soil, blood and guts. Beaches turned red, trees exploded, cattle perished, and men breathed their last. D-Day was just the first day. The battle for Normandy raged on well into August, and Paris was liberated August 25, 1944. The scarring of Normandy and the shedding of blood was the result of many men and their designs, either for conquest or for occupation or for liberation. And in many ways, what happened on D-Day offers a scaled-down preview of the world's final battle. Like World War II France, we suffer under the heel of a brutal tyrant who illegitimately occupies our world. His name is Satan. He imposes death, destruction, and misery. Like the oppressed citizens of France in the 1940s, we too cry out for liberation from this cruel oppressor. But as we are assured in Revelation 19, liberation will come, for we have a supreme commander who has never lost a battle. And he is simply waiting for the strategic moment when he will descend and crush forever the forces that have invaded his world. We await the final trumpet, the last command, when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, greater love hath no man than this Jesus, the Lion of Judah, who has conquered and is our victor. Hallelujah. And this 
this great coming of the Lord, which I have described both in, in the fiction and in the facts, never was captured so well as in the song Bill Gaither wrote, Listen and Rejoice, Our King is Coming. Thank you, Dan. is empty no more traffic in the street all the builders tools are silent no more time to harvest wheat many housewives cease their labor in the courtroom no debate we're gone been suspended as the king comes through the gate. Happy faces line the hallway. Those whose lives have been redeemed. Broken homes that he has mended. Those from prison he has freed. Little children and the aged Hand in hand stand all aglow Who were crippled, broken, ruined Clad in garments white as snow The King is coming The King is coming Sounding and soon his face I'll see. The king is coming, the king is coming. Praise God, he's coming for me. And the fury of God's trumpet Spell the end of sin and wrong Regal homes are now unfolded Heaven's great stand all in place Heaven's choir is now assembled Oh, the King 
Oh, man.